if you would like to stand, we'll sing number 508, to the work. serving here at the Woodland Hills Church of Christ. My friends, God is good, and He's good all of the time, and, and personally I'm excited because he's, he's blessed us with additional spiritual leadership. We're now, as a congregation, turning our attention to the process of selecting additional deacons for the work here, and if God wills, we'll appoint them at the end of September. As such, today, it's, it's my, my task to, to preach about the, the role of deacons in the Lord's church. Tonight, Tim Purdom will speak about effective deacons and uh, give us a lesson uh, from the example of Stephen. And next week, Taylor Ladd will follow up by discussing the qualifications of deacons. So to, to get things started, what I'd like to do is zoom out for a little bit and, and talk about the New Testament pattern of church government from a, a wider perspective and then zoom back in and, and talk about and focus about deacons specifically. So that's the roadmap for this morning. You know, whether we're talking about a business or a city council, a government, or a, a church, some type of Leadership, some type of organization is, is always needed. It's, it's actually critical. Why is that? Because it's a well-known fact that group activities 
Whatever they are, they're, they're not going to survive very long without some form of government, some sort of uh, leadership and organization in play. So with that in mind, how should Christ's church be organized? How should it be led? I mean, there's, a, there's actually a lot of different types of church uh, governments and organization and structure out there. So is the decision left up to us? Has God given us the, the liberty to implement whatever we feel or whatever we think as the most efficient form of, of church government? Or has God made that decision himself and has he revealed it in his word? Uh, so whether it's what we call ourselves as a church, what day we assemble on, what goes on in our our worship assembly, or how the church should be organized. My friends, we believe something. We believe that the answer is the same. It's God's decision. It's His church, and, and not ours. So, what kind of uh, leadership has God revealed in the New Testament? As we set about to answer that question, let's start briefly by, by examining three basic forms of church government that you'll find out in the broader religious community. The three types are uh, Episcopal and Presbyterian and Congregational. So let's start with Episcopal or the Episcopalian form of church government. An Episcopal system of church government gets its name from a Greek word. That's the Greek word of Episkopos which is normally translated overseer. And we can see that word, we can see that, that term in texts uh, such as Acts 20, uh, verse 28, which says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, or episcopos. And of course, in Titus chapter 1, verse 7, which says, For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above Reproach. And again, that word is episkopos. So in the Episcopalian system, a minister or a, a priest has authority over a local congregation. But that congregation is not self-ruling. It's, it's not autonomous. They don't rule themselves. Instead, the authority comes from someone who is not actually a member of that local church. And this person is typically referred to as a bishop. And these, these bishops are a, a group of people who, who rule over a group of churches. And uh, that's called a, a diocese. And sometimes there's even a higher level of organization where an archbishop rules over a group of bishops. And so in this system of government... The lower levels usually have little say in the specific minister or priest that will oversee them. And, and similarly, uh, the ministers and the priests, they have no say in the bishop that oversees them, and the bishops have no say in the archbishop that oversees them. And so the Roman Catholic Church is probably the most famous example of church government um, uh, when it comes to mind of uh, Episcopal governments. However, the Eastern Orthodox churches, the, the Anglican church, and of course the Episcopal church also stand as examples of this type of church organization. So that's the Episcopal system of church organization. Let's briefly examine the second form of church government that I mentioned that's commonly used today, and that's the Presbyterian system. That word comes from the Greek word uh, Presbyterios, uh, presbyteros, which is usually translated elder. And in this system, each local uh, congregation is governed by a plurality of elders. And these individuals, they are selected by the congregation from its own membership. But like the Episcopalian system, there's another, there's another level of authority above and beyond the local congregation in that system. That means the Presbyterian churches are not self-ruling. They're not autonomous either. So in this form of government, all the, the churches in a particular area form a, a regional body of elders called a presbytery. 
So the presbytery then governs all the congregations in that region. So this means that it's typically the presbytery who installs the ministers in the local churches. It's, it's the presbytery that, that offers and administers discipline to the churches. It is the one that plants and dissolves uh, churches. It usually owns the property of each church. And there's also one or two more levels of authority above the presbytery who deal with issues on a, on a national level. These, these higher levels also act as a court of appeals of, of sorts for the lower levels. And so church groups such as the Presbyterians will obviously hold to this form of church government, but often churches identifying as Reformed will do so as well. And so you have Episcopal system and you have the, the Presbyterian system. You also have a third form of government, which is known as the Congregational system of government. And that's the one I want to touch upon this morning briefly. In, in this system, there is no higher authority above the local congregation. And each, uh, each congregation is autonomous. Each congregation is self-ruling. And so in an autonomous church, that means no other church, no other ruling body, no other denominational board gets to tell what the local church uh, can do and, and what they can't do. So each congregation in this system owns its own property, chooses and selects its, its own leaders, selects its own preacher or preachers, and makes its own decisions. So which one are we? The, the church here at Woodland Hills, in academic terms, uses a congregational system of government. Now, that's the data. Here's the question. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Is it because of tradition? Is it because that's what we've done for years and, and years? Or perhaps we've tried all the different forms and then decided that this one is best for us. No, my friends, or as Paul said, may it never be. We choose to use the congregational model because that's the pattern we can read about in the New Testament. If you don't know this already, or don't know this about this church, we're passionate about something. We're passionate about following God's will, about how He wants His church to be, to be organized. And if you read through the New Testament, there's actually no mention anywhere in the New Testament of anyone who has authority over a local church except the elders of that church, and of course the apostles themselves. So, the New Testament pattern for church organization and leadership is clearly congregational. So, now that we've established that, it's time to zoom in, like I talked about, and, and examine how each local church was governed. If you read through your New Testament, what you'll find there is that God places two special offices and to each local church, the, uh, the office of the eldership and the office of the deacons. And we can see this in, in Paul's letter to the Christians in Philippi, which, which addresses all the saints, all the saints, all the Christians, all the saints in Christ Jesus who were at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons, according to Philippians 1 after 1. And Paul also lists qualifications for the roles of elders and deacons in such places as 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 13. So, as a congregation, we, you know this. We've already spent much time studying the office of an elder, and, and I won't belabor that, but we've seen that it is God's plan, His desire for each congregation to have elders that act as overseers to shepherd God's church. These are the men who direct the affairs of the local church, and they watch out for the spiritual uh, well-being of, of each member. How do they do that? By feeding God's flock, by feeding us, making sure that those who are under their care are being taught truth, so that uh, they will grow up into the image and conform to the image of Jesus Christ. Uh, they, they protect us. 
Uh, they, they make sure that the, uh, the congregation is not exposed to false teachers and false teaching. And when such occurs, they silence them. Of course, by taking care of us in a general way, they, they, they help us deal with our lives. They help us uh, deal with sin in our lives and things like that. So that's the role of the elders. Again, I'm not going to belabor that. Let's, let's focus on the role of deacons. What is a deacon anyway? The word deacon, it, it, it comes from the word diakonos. Diakonos, and the general meaning of that word is a servant, a helper, or, or someone who ministers to the needs of others. That's, that's a diakonos, that's a servant. And a servant is one who is under the authority of others. You can see an example of that in Matthew 8, verses 5 through 10, where the centurion speaks of this when he says, for I too am a, man, am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to you, one go, and he goes, and to another come, and he comes, and to my servant do this, and he does it. And so the word diakonos is actually used a couple of different ways in the New Testament, if you look uh, for that word. Often it's used in a very general sense to refer to any worker any servant. So, for example, in John 2, in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 5, Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, is speaking uh, at the wedding in Cana, and she says to the servants, to the diakonos, do whatever he tells you. The government official in Romans chapter 13, verse 4, is called a diakonos, for he is God's servant, he is God's diakonos for your benefit. For your good. The Apostle Paul names himself as a diakonos in Ephesians 3, verse 7. He says, of this gospel, I was made a diakonos. I was made a, a minister according to the gift of God's grace. And Phoebe, we know about Phoebe. Uh, she was called a diakonos in Romans 16, verse 1. I commend you to our sister Phoebe. She's a diakonos. She's a servant of the church at Centria. And, if, uh, and if you, I don't know if you, you, you knew this or not, but the Lord, he's named a diakonos. Or Lord Jesus Christ, he's named a diakonos in Romans 15, verse 8. For I tell you that Christ became a, a diakonos, a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness. And, and of course, every one of us who are Christian, it's translated into the word deacon. Philippians 1, 1, we've already stated it, but let's just see it again. So all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, deacons must be uh, likewise dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. And 1 Timothy 3, verse 12 says, let deacons each be the husband of of one wife managing their children and their own households as well. So, like he did with elders, God has revealed, he has, he has given us a list of qualifications in the New Testament that a man must meet in order to serve in this role. And I'm not going to elaborate on those qualifications this morning because uh, Brother Taylor is going to be covering that material next week. But let me say this. The list of qualifications for a deacon is found right on the heels of the list for the eldership. That's important. As a church that is serious and passionate about following God's pattern for leadership, we should be taking these qualifications for, uh, for a deacon just as seriously as we do for that of our elders. So, what do deacons do, anyway? What's the role of, uh, of a deacon in, in a local church? Like I mentioned before, uh, the general word of the word uh, diakonos is that of a servant, a helper, a, a minister who serves the, the needs of others. So in a general sense, this is true of deacons. Deacons are servants. But the office of deacon and its service is distinct from that of Christians in general. We can see this in Acts 6. If you haven't done so already, please turn with me to Acts 6. 
uh, verses 1 through 6, where this text actually stands as a prototype of sorts for the role of deacon in the local church. Here, uh, the background is that the Hellenist Christians were complaining that their widows were being neglected. So let's pick up in, chapter, in verse verse 2, chapter 6, verse 2, and read through verse 4. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we'll appoint to this duty. But we'll devote ourselves, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So, Although the seven men selected to take care of these widows aren't actually called deacons in this text, they definitely serve as a prototype. They definitely serve as a a model. They were chosen by the church to serve tables. And in doing so, the twelve apostles were allowed to do their work. The apostles could have been bogged down, if you will, with trying to provide for the needs of those widows, It would have been very hard to teach when you know that there are people in the congregation who are going hungry. And so so, uh, what the the deacons did was very important. Um, Instead, the apostles appointed a group of, of godly men, such as Philip the Evangelist and Stephen, who would go on to become the first Christian martyr, and uh, Tim. We'll talk about more uh, about that tonight. So then... Based on the pattern that's established in Acts 6, it really seems best to define deacons as trusted servants who will do whatever is necessary to allow the eldership to carry out their work of teaching and guiding the church. So as a result, each church, each local church, is is free to define the task of deacons based off the, the particular needs in that particular location. So... Let's get down to this. What are some of the duties that that deacons might be responsible for today? Uh, Building in the grounds. Building in in, the grounds. We have such a nice building. We have such a nice facility. We have such nice grounds. Uh, But those, these these things take work and maintenance. For example, what do deacons do? If you were to ask me that um, about 9.30 last night, I'd tell you something specific. I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine Rick Burroughs uh, on a a ladder right here, reaching all the way up to the the projector. You see the projector right there? About 7 o'clock at night, that projector just started to stop working. I don't want to work anymore. I was here, I was going through my my, my lesson material and going through my run-through, and all of a sudden, the machine just shut off. I had no idea why. I tried to fiddle with it. I tried to fiddle with the laptop. Couldn't make it work. I called Rick. Rick was eating his dinner. And I think the last thing that Rick probably wanted to do was come down to the building and help the the preacher figure out the PowerPoint machine. But he did it, and he did it with a great attitude. Great attitude. So he he came down here, and he got up uh, uh, in the air, and he started looking at things. He actually called Connor Nash. We're talking about servants today. Connor Nash came down from La Fountain, and he and Rick... Uh, troubleshot that thing and, and figured out exactly what's wrong. They, they switched some cords around, and I was able to take a picture of Rick Burroughs in the middle of the air up on, on the ladder, and Connor's down here, and with that screen saying, what do deacons do? It's exactly what deacons do. It's not the only thing that deacons do, besides being the church property and, and, and things like that. Uh, they might be... Uh, they will be uh, responsible for benevolence. Uh, Based off what we just read in in Acts 6, uh, 1 through 6, with the daily distribution of food to the widows, the deacons here might be involved in administering funds or assisting the needy. They'll be uh, involved in finances. Perhaps they're going to be collecting and counting the offering and keeping records and things like that. They'll be the ones who will be Responsible, who might be responsible for distributing uh, bulletins and helping visitors follow, uh, find their seats and things like that. And of course, that's by no means an exhaustive list. There's a principle here, though, 
The principle is that a deacon's work is that which is assigned to him by the elders to take care of the needs of the congregation, and specifically the physical needs of the congregation. So, furthermore, no matter in what particular capacity they serve, Scripture wants us to, to know something about the work of deacons. It's a rewarding and it's an honorable call. Consider 1 Timothy 3, verse 13 with me. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and a great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. My friends, good deacons are a blessing, a blessing straight from God. And so, in Acts 6, when they were appointed and they did their work in, in, in the setting of, of that scripture, the complaining stopped, the needs were met, uh, the word increased, the disciples multiplied, and the deacons grew in faith and in service. Uh, look at verses 7 and 8 in Acts 6. The word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and the great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace, and of power, I was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So, the church today needs good elders to lead. And it also needs competent, spirit-led, and willing men to, to, to serve in the capacity of deacons. Last thing I want to mention uh, about deacons this morning, and then the lesson is, is yours, I think it's important to mention that just like every other member of the local church, deacons are under the authority and the oversight of the elders. They're not junior elders, as it were. That's not really a, an issue at the church here, but it is a known issue in the broader religious community. Now, according to 1 Timothy 5, 17, the elders are the, the men who are to direct the affairs of the church, and they are the ones who are ultimately responsible for the decision-making uh, in the Lord's church as the Bible has revealed. And yet, I should emphasize that the deacons are not the only servants here at the church. It would be a mistake to view them as being responsible for, for doing everything uh, really, everyone here who is willing to serve will have many opportunities to do so. So don't forget something. Don't forget that every single one of us uh, is to be a diakonos, in a sense. We are to be a, a servant in the general sense. And we really should all make it a priority to serve each other and God. So as Christians, we believe that all Scripture, all of it is God-breathed. Therefore, we believe that God has spoken about how He wants His church to be organized. And to be led. So, as a result of that, we're not free to rethink and replace the New Testament pattern of congregational autonomy, of congregational self-rule with any other form, even if we think they are more efficient or better fit our culture or our time. We're not free to do that. We're also not free to rethink the two offices that God has Ordained the office of the elders and the office uh, and the office of the deacons and we should also not ignore or change even one of the God-given qualifications for being an elder or being a deacon and We've seen that based off of the pattern that we find in Acts 6 deacons are trusted servants that the elders can rely upon to help support the work of the church churches may use deacons in different ways the position of the deacon is an extremely important one, and it comes with a blessing reserved for them. I, I hope this study has uh, helped you to understand what God's plan is for his church and how he wants it to be governed. And I'm really looking forward to the process of selecting additional deacons from among the qualified men here. And, and I do that because I know that such trusted servants will be a big help as we do our best to win souls and advance the cause of Christ's kingdom. I'd like to now extend an invitation. I'd like to now extend an invitation to anyone here that desires to become a Christian and, and start a life of being blessed by God. The Bible tells us that we become a Christian by believing in Jesus and confessing His name repenting of our sin, being baptized, 
in water as an appeal for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ for the purpose of washing away our, our sins, calling on his name. If we can assist you in any kind of spiritual way, please, please come forward while we stand and sing. There is room in the king.